Walker, Mr. Thomas Simons. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, I brought water with me, so you know that means I'm going to talk for a long time. Just kidding. I'm very, very pleased to be here to join all of you for a couple of reasons. The first reason that occurred to me as I was driving here is that this campus, Pasadena City College, is the first college campus that I ever set foot on as a kid. And I'll explain more about that to you in a minute. But the other reason I'm glad to be here is that I'm counting on every one of you in the audience to make sure when I get even more gray hair or lose my hair and choose to retire, that this state, this country, this world continue to thrive and move toward justice and inclusion so that I can retire comfortably. I'm counting on every one of you to make sure that that happens. In a minute, I'm going to tell you why and how. But I first want to talk to you a little bit about my organization. I hope that some of you have heard of MALDEF. But for those of you who have not, I want to tell you a little bit about our history. And I want to convince you of the importance of our mission. And ultimately, I want to convince you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our email newsletters, and learn more about the work that we're involved in on behalf of the Latino community. Now, MALDEF is an organization that was founded in 1968, 44 years ago. It was founded in San Antonio, Texas. It was founded by a group of Latino activists, lawyers, non-lawyers, community leaders from throughout the southwestern United States, from California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas. They founded this organization to represent the Latino community and its interests in fighting for equality and justice in the court system. Our lead founder was a lawyer by the name of Pete Tijerina. Tijerina, who has now passed away, was inspired as he told the story to work with that group of leaders from across the Southwest to found MALDEF by an experience that he had as a lawyer in South Texas. Now, even though it was 44 years ago, and that seems like a long time, 44 years ago in 1968, just as today, South Texas had a lot of Mexican-American and Latino residents. But Tijerina had been a lawyer, and his experience throughout his entire career had been that none of the juries that heard his cases included any Latinos whatsoever. They were all white juries because that was still the prevailing discriminatory practice in South Texas. Despite the fact that 14 years before 1968, the United States Supreme Court had made clear in a case called Hernandez versus Texas, the first significant Latino civil rights case to go before the US Supreme Court in 1954, the same year as Brown versus Board of Education that historic unanimous decision obtained by the NACP Legal Defense Fund to dismantle school segregation. But despite of Nandes versus Texas in 1954, in 1968, Tijerina's experience still was that there were no Mexican-American jurors. But he had a client, the Latina woman who had been severely injured as a result of the wrongdoing of a corporation. And he believed that in the justice system that he worked in, she should receive a significant, significant verdict against that company. But he also knew that he would never get such a verdict for a Latina plaintiff with an all-white jury. So he went before the judge and he made a passionate argument about the injustice of excluding the large Mexican-American population from serving on juries. And the judge heard him. And the judge said, come back in a few weeks, and the jury commissioner and I will ensure that there are Mexican-American jurors eligible to sit on your client's jury. As he told the story years later, he came back after the requisite period of time. 
And the judge and jury commissioner had managed to identify two, two potential Mexican-American jurors. As it turned out, one of them was already dead and therefore could not serve as a juror. And one of them was not a citizen and therefore was disqualified. As a result, as he told the story, he had to settle his client's case for pennies on the dollar of what she should have received as he understood the justice system. Now that experience convinced him to ally with those others to create an organization whose mission would be to use the legal system to promote the civil rights of all Latinos living in the United States. They succeeded. Maldet opened its doors in San Antonio 44 years ago. Now in the intervening 44 years, of course, the nation has changed, the Latino population has changed. We have grown. Latinos are now the largest minority group in the country, representing one in six Americans. One out of six. We are represented in significant numbers in every region and virtually every state of this country. But nonetheless, you all know, we continue to face challenges in the courts, in education, in employment, in laws that are passed that seem to target our community, in Arizona and other places. So the mission of Malda has only grown. But this week in particular, I'm very excited and very encouraged about the future. The future that I'm counting on every one of you to ensure is a prosperous one, not just for the Latino community, but for the entire nation. Now we quickly decided our founders realized that California, not Texas, don't tell anybody in Texas I said this, but the California was really the most important state for the Latino population. We moved our headquarters early in our history to California, but we maintain offices not just here in Los Angeles, but still in San Antonio, Texas, in Chicago, Illinois, in Washington, D.C., in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Sacramento, California. All of that to ensure that our nation will live up to its constitutional principles. I have had the great, great privilege and honor of leading the lawyers and others who work at MALDEF in this mission of promoting civil rights for the last three years. But I have spent 15 years out of my 21-year legal career at MALDEF. Like every one of my predecessors as president of MALDEF, I am the eighth president in the history of the organization. Like every one of my predecessors, and like most of the lawyers who work for me today, I am the first lawyer in my family. I am a first generation university graduate. That is to say that my parents, my parents who promoted education to my brother and to me, did not have the opportunity to go to university. Now I mentioned previously this is the first college campus here, PCC, that I ever set foot on. The reason is that both of my parents are graduates of this college. My father got his associate degree when I was five years old. And I remember him going to school at night after working for the LA Department of Water and Power, taking classes at night to get that degree when I was five. And I remember, vaguely, because I was young, coming with my mother on occasion and my brother to pick him up from school here. So this is the first campus I ever set foot on. Now after he received that degree, my mother decided that she wanted to get her associate's degree as well. And she too, after working in the Alhambra School District in Alhambra where I grew up, went to night school here and she got her associate of arts degree when I was 15 years old in high school, knowing that very soon my brother and I would go on to our own college experience. Now despite that, my brother and I went on to great universities. You've already heard from Sid that I went to Yale University. I think the greatest university in the country. But my brother who's a year older than, than me, only one year, but he has much more gray hair, trust me. My brother went on to the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York. 
He has been a career officer in the United States Army. He is now a colonel commanding a garrison in Germany. I'm very proud of him. My parents are very proud of him. My brother and I have both committed ourselves to community service. He in the military, I through working on civil rights in the legal arena. And I encourage each and every one of you to take the opportunity to get that university education and go on to contribute to the community. I want to cite one more example to you. You already heard what a historic week this has been. Tiring but historic. It is historic because of what Sid has already alluded to. On Tuesday, I hope you were following the election returns. I hope you are always following what happens in our elections because those are the mechanism by which we determine who will set policy, who will determine whether civil rights, equality, and justice will be promoted further in this nation. But if you watched on Tuesday, what you heard was a recognition by virtually every commentator of the significance of the Latino vote and the Latino community to the re-election of President Obama. For the first time in our history, 10%, one in 10 voters across the entire nation was Latino. With even higher percentages in critical states like this one, and in swing states like Nevada, Colorado, Florida, you heard those commentators if you watched explaining that the Latino community made the difference. But I want to go back further to tell you more about that story. Because let me tell you, at the beginning of the summer, if nothing had changed, Latinos would not have been 10% of the vote. Latinos would not have voted 70 plus percent for the president. I will tell you what made the difference in my view. On June 15th of this year, President Obama made an announcement. He chose to make that announcement on the 30th anniversary of a critical Supreme Court decision. A decision in a case brought by my organization, Maldef. In 1982, the U.S. Supreme Court concluded that despite the state of Texas's efforts to bar the schoolhouse door to undocumented students, that our Constitution our Equal Protection Clause guarantees every student the right to attend public school from kindergarten through 12th grade, regardless of immigration status. A singularly important decision by the Supreme Court. Not often recognized, but of critical importance, particularly today. But on the 30th anniversary of that decision, President Obama announced a historic program called Deferred Action for childhood arrivals. A program that would protect from removal or deportation dreamers, students who have been called dreamers. They're called dreamers because of the DREAM Act, a proposal in Congress for over a decade that is yet to be enacted that would recognize these students as Americans. They are students who arrived in this country at a young age, were raised here, were educated here, went on to university education or military or community service. But despite all of those markers of being American, they are undocumented because they came here without legal status as children. The program that President Obama announced, Deferred Action, is what enabled him to inspire the Latino community to come out and vote, and to vote in high percentages for his reelection. I tell you that prior to that announcement, there was so much dissatisfaction with the president's inability to enact new and more just immigration laws 
that this, without that announcement, Latinos would not have come out in the numbers and in the proportions that they did for the president's re-election. But let me conclude the story. That announcement did not come from some advisor in the White House or in the Department of Homeland Security. That announcement came because of the efforts of those students, those dreamers, those Americans who by happenstance lack status. Without their pressure, without their being in the community to change the community's mind about the issue, without their allying and collaborating with others, including dozens of law professors who provided a public letter telling the president that he could enact such a program. Without their pressure, the administration never would have made that announcement. I want you to reflect on that for just a minute. What those youth did led directly to what happened this Tuesday when the Latino vote made the difference. Those students, those dreamer youth and their allies made the difference in this election. But reflect on that for a moment. This is a group of youth who lack any of the traditional markers of political influence. By definition, not one of them can vote. None of them can vote. They're not citizens and lack the right to vote. By definition, they lack the ability to be elected in their own right to office. They don't have lots of money. They're not a corporation, they're not a wealthy individual who can donate to the president's campaign or to an independent committee supporting the president or his opponent. And yet this group of youth without any of those traditional markers of political influence in this country changed a presidential election. That is the power of organized youth, regardless of background, regardless of citizenship, regardless of status, that is an indication of the power that you all have as youth to change this nation. This dreamer movement, it's not only composed of those who would be eligible under the DREAM Act or be eligible for deferred action, but of their allies, their classmates, their colleagues. The leadership of this group are Latino youth. This is the most vibrant youth movement in this entire country from any sector in 40 years. You would have to go back to the Vietnam War era, the Civil Rights era, to identify as powerful a youth movement as the Dreamers and their allies. Latino youth, this week, change the future of this country. And it is with that inspiration that I came here this morning to ask all of you to continue that work. Go on to university education. Go on to community service. Go on to serving your families, the places you grew up, the communities you come from. The example is there. I'm sure that many of you in the audience are already a part of that dreamer movement. The potential of that movement reached its high point this week, but I know and expect more will come in the future. The power of Latino youth in this country has no limits. each of you to change this country has no limits. When you see no limits, I know that you will accomplish what we expect and believe you can accomplish. 
which is a nation that is true to its greatest ideals of equality and justice for everyone. I look forward to your fulfilling that mission.